Um, so welcome everyone to another in-depth. Um, we're Open Team, the Open Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management, and that's a project of Wolf's Next Center for Agriculture and the Environment. Um, our dynamic and growing community now consists of over 35 organizations and 200 individuals who are active every month in various working groups and open team related work streams. So our in-depth learning series uh, helps build uh, the knowledge base of this community in a way that fosters coherence and collaboration. Each in-depth helps us to collaboratively evaluate new concepts and technologies in an effort to ask better questions and to build better tools through sharing our work. So we seek to address common barriers rather than promote any specific solution. So today with us, we have Nejma Balarbi, who is the co-founder of Terra Ethics. Uh, and she's going to uh, discuss the rights of nature with us and examine and explore pathways uh, that can help support lasting solutions where both ecosystems and industry can benefit in the long term. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to you, Nejma, from here. We'll have uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes of a presentation and the rest of the time will be uh, reserved for some Q&A. So keep those questions um, in mind. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Nejma, for joining us today and being willing to present. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna try to make this quick as much as I can. Um, let me see here. I'm just gonna try to share my screen. Here we go. Can everybody see that okay? Perfect. Can you see my speaker's notes? <laughs> no. no, we cannot. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, Rights of Nature, thanks everyone um, for coming today. Um, like Laura said, I'm a consultant with Terra Ethics, and we do work in supporting collaborative design towards ethical sustainability and equity in practice. And some of the work that we've been doing has been around Rights of Nature. And so I'm honored to be here today with all of you and share some of our insights on this topic. So um, I was really happy to present for the working group last week um, through, and it was Rights of Nature through um, and Equity, <clears throat> which are very interrelated. And so there's going to be some aspects of that in this presentation, although I'm going a little bit more in depth in the legal aspects. Um, so what are rights of nature, right? So they're based on inherent rights or fundamental rights of all beings, right? So meaning that each being that is here is of equal value, essentially. Um, <clears throat> this conceptual framework of rights of nature is present in most traditional and indigenous worldviews and sciences and teachings. Um, in some of my cross-cultural research, um, especially in the concepts of biocultural diversity or ecosystems, ecological lens in my experience as an ethnobotanist um, and through various conversations and the work that I've been conducting for many years with Indigenous elders and my own elders, um, the concept of intrinsic value um, is, is very present um, in most philosophical or spiritual practical teachings around the globe um, and even actually so what's been exciting now is that even through Cartesian um, science um, we're seeing again the resurgence of an understanding of the symbiotic relationships in ecosystems which we are part of um, and it's really exciting because it's almost like we're getting to the whole and recognizing the different ways of knowing and knowledge diversity which is really important in this concept um, <clears throat> so one of the first Western mentions of the rights of nature's of nature is seen um, through Christopher Stone, um, which wrote who wrote an essay in 1972 about should trees have standing, 
Um, that's definitely something that we've been thinking a lot about because of the logging around here. Um, but um, essentially the concept is inalienable rights of nature. So, and it has been used as a tool now to bring balance between ecosystem legal personhood and industrial legal personhood because ecosystems actually don't have legal personhood at this point. Um, so that's been the tool to try to leverage um, with industrial legal personhood. And then Thomas Berry um, sort of created the 10 principles of jurisprudence, um, which is a philosophy of law and human governance. That's based on the fact that humans are only part of a wider community of beings and that the welfare of each member of that community is dependent on the welfare of the earth as a whole, including us. So uh, when we look at equity and equitable behavior and equity in practice, it, it has to come from an understanding of fundamental value to everyone. So it's not just rights. Rights and laws are based on rights um, that are tools to prevent harm, essentially, right? And they have to be based on fundamentals, right? So because our system is based on gauging value in law, for example, but also sort of as we're walking around, um, which is in itself problematic, right? Because it's almost moot in a way, sort of how we've been looking at it and, you know, agreeing on because you know, gauging value of nature or people can't really be, can't be done without biases, which is normal because of our upbringing and histories and so on and so forth, positionality. So the perspective of gauging the value of people and environment um, is very extractive in nature. Um, and, and unfortunately, we also um, gauge our own internal value by attributing it to social positions, for example, which is also problematic and erroneous because value is already intrinsic, right, to all regardless of position or wealth and so on and so forth. So that's a really big part of the ecological lens. And although it seems like it's unrelated, it's actually quite related. It's kind of how we got here again, right? So um, let's see here. So yeah, the lack of the concept of fundamental and intrinsic uh, value um, it was not the you know the force behind our operating systems, right? In a sense that we're operating in now, and so this unfortunately led to a continuance of a perspective that all beings were up for exploitation, essentially, um, which is a very common perspective, and that and continues to cause many issues. So again, it's a lot of these things, a lot of this presentation is, is based on perspectives because they are the fundamentals and the foundations of, um, of our operating system. I want to say operating system, which I think really fits well with this crew. <laughs> but anyways, so, um, so corporate legal personhood, which is again, the concept that the rights of nature are trying to leverage, right? Um, I used to think that it was very recent, but it actually, um, the corporate legal personhood dates back to 800 BC. And so, um, and it, I think one of the first places where it has been seen was through guilds um, in India. And then the late Roman Republic continued the trend, which made sense because collective entities could enter into contract and stay alive, if you will, past the mortality of the individual individuals that operate them, right? So that's the same kind of situation here now with businesses and corporations and so on. So legal personhood of industry um, today serves the same purpose. It can enter into contract with others. It can acquire land. Um, but the issue is that extractive industry is structured around profit. Um, and so we're seeing we are seeing more corporate responsibility now, especially through funding streams and addressing conservation and equity issues. Um, but the structure itself, um, systemically, corporations as legal persons can like sue for loss of profit, if you will, right? Um, so if you wanna stop logging in an area, there's a breach of contract actually. And usually, you know, the loss of profit or livelihood um, for the business or the industry is the framework of legal personality, which also, again, makes sense through the lens of law because of protection, right? So there's no leverage, however, for ecosystems. <laughs> and so we enter into this polarized situation between industry and conservation or 
uh, what we've seen a lot here in Canada is industry and indigenous peoples as well. And then what we've seen around the world is industry and farmers um, and so on and so forth. So there is a cognitive dissonance there um, and sort of, yeah, like an issue within the whole structure. Um, but we're getting closer in merging these issues, which is fantastic. But as we know, <clears throat> there's both a cap on the resources that provide profit and the missing fundamental lens within our economic structures, which are now, we're like right up against, uh, both and in, as industry and community. So legal personhood of ecosystems has been used as a tool in a way to leverage this issue. Um, but it also brings the opportunity of needing to redefine economic value, which I think is a really important aspect of the rights of nature. So the ecological legal personhood plays some of these roles. Um, so it defines an ecosystem as a right-bearing entity. Um, and it can have, which allows an ecosystem to have a voice and to enter into negotiations with industry. Um, and it can also enter into contract with industry, essentially, right? Um, and be protected. So, so what's different about the rights of nature and legal personhood of ecosystems is the collaborative possibility, right? So it's, and the assertion of fundamental value. So it has the potential to bring us full circle in our relational engagements with nature, but also with each other. Um, this is also where we can see convergence of equity and rights of nature, like I was saying. Um, for one, it's a model that has to incorporate Indigenous law and worldview into the Western law system. And also, like I mentioned, reaffirming equitable and collaborative behavior through, through the concept of intrinsic and fundamental value, which is a really important place to start from. <clears throat> so, um, so, so even if it is through law, which has been one of the arguments of of folks um, about rights of nature. Um, Jacinta Ruru, who's a lawyer in New Zealand, and as we know, um, <clears throat> Maori were able to um, put into a treaty with the Crown um, the relationship that they have with uh, the Waganui River, and that it is a living, um, rights bearing entity, essentially. And so she, Actually, she has this really amazing TED talk, which I really highly recommend. So Jacinta Ruru, <laughs> are you, are you? Um, and one of the things that she says is that shifting our understanding, it, like it, it's really about shifting our understanding of our positions within the natural world, right? So it's changing our understanding of ownership in particular to stewardship, but it, you know, it's also, um, it's also a paradigm shift in, you know, bringing us closer of being part of a greater ecosystem, right, rather than separate from it, which is often, like, if you look at our systems, you know, we're operating as if that is, in fact, the reality that we are separate. Um, so, you know, and I often actually say that systems are benign, and they're only as functional as the paradigm of the people that operate them, you know, so it still stays within perspective. Um, so if the current structure is based on ownership, you know, then the relational lens with the living, you know, beings that depend on that space is really pivotal on how we manage it. And, you know, there's another thing that she says where, you know, it shifts, you know, the, the rights of nature um, really shifts our understanding from a perspective of managing land to managing people, which is very different, right? Um, <clears throat> so, the, you know, the truth, as we see it anyway, is that there's a symbiotic relationship here between people and ecosystems. Um, and ecosystems actually do better when there are people with this understanding of relational engagement, um, when it is about stewardship, you know, and not and not just like your survival means my survival, <laughs> although that is true, but, you know, there's other concepts of, you know, of responsibility and so on and so forth, right? And the lens of, you know, ecosystem lens is very much based on this, on this sort of, um, you know, give and take, right? So, <clears throat> right. So as far as, you know, as we navigate regulations of ecosystem, like ecosystems health and the lawful or judicial aspects of rights of nature, um, 
or the structure, the structure has been implemented in different, it, it actually has been implemented in different ways across the world. There's, you know, the rights of mother nature, um, which have been really pivotal to this movement in South America, particularly, um, but it has spread, uh, you know, um, into all sorts of different um, ways of implementing it. But like the way that I like to go about it is looking, or at least when we started to do the research and the work that we're doing here on um, in this territory um, is looking at binding and non-binding laws, right? And so um, we uh, have actually been co collaborating with Earth Law Center who have been amazing um, at supporting um, this project that we're doing here through an indigenous lens um, and and they're very very well versed in the nuances of law in this category again i'm an ethnobotanist and so i'm not i'm not a lawyer <laughs> um but but it, it has been a phenomenal um process um in trying to bridge this cognitive dissonance in fact between law and worldview um ecosystem-based worldview um so yeah, the binding and non-binding categories are a good way to deconstruct the diversity of ways of rights of nature, I find, right? So, um, so both binding and non-binding strategies play an important role in shaping social norms and articulating new worldviews, essentially. So there's a number of different legal mechanisms that have been used uh, by local and indigenous governments to pass rights of nature. Um, local ordinances can be seen as an umbrella for legally binding mechanisms, right, used by local or indigenous governments. And, you know, um, I just wanted to sort of read this excerpt from Dr. David Boyd. Um, he writes that ordinances typically aim to protect the health, safety, and general welfare of the citizens and environments in question um, through limiting or removing the constitutional rights granted to corporations. So that's one way that people have been doing it. So in the Tamaka Boro Sewage Sludge Ordinance, for example, in the states, the first community ordinance actually to recognize the rights of nature in the United States, they explicitly deny corporation status as persons under the law and then and the need to consider natural environments beyond conceptions of property. Um, you know, looking more in depth into that, you can see that it's you know, there's definitely has been some issues with with that particular um, framework. But similarly, in 2018, the Ponca Nation. Uh, became the first indigenous group in the United States to pass a resolution on the rights of nature as a response to the extensive fracking that was done all around their traditional lands. And so ordinances are like typically include explicit language about legal standing, right? So you can't really get very creative about it, like as far as like worldview or, you know, um, like a more holistic understanding because it still has to be within um, a law full legalese, right? That's the word. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> and so, um, but it allows the community and any of its citizens to file a lawsuit on behalf of nature for any harm done, right? So that's the case in Ecuador, for example, um, which has been successful. So they may be binding technically, but they're not always upheld. That's another issue. And also there's a risk of litigation from the strong legal standing of corporations or states and you know funds and so on or whatever, which causes some issues in trying to um, address um, some of these problems. Um, but you know, for us, we always think that um, uh, uh, what's the word? Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Um, litigation, that's the word. <laughs> so litigation is always, we like the way that we're working it is, is really the last, last, last resort. And there's so many other things that we can do collaboratively before we actually get to that. And hopefully we don't get to it at all. That's the idea. So so on the other hand, non-binding um, laws of rights of nature um, are often based on declarations. So declarations are usually non-binding, but they still serve to bring in paradigm shifts that folks can really get behind. And you can use very creative language. Also, they're more diverse in the sense um, in using language such as the, the Waganui River example um, in New Zealand. Um, so declarations in a way serve to create language that supports a worldview that is based on intrinsic value and relational engagement with nature and community. So it's coming at it from the opposite end. So rather than being law first, it's perspective first. And often, actually, a declaration can be adopted 
as a legally binding instrument. Um, so that's also a point that comes up, like I was saying about rights of nature and the aspect of legal personality and the idea of rendering ecosystems in nature as part of a, you know, like a, a lawful system, which takes away its fundamental meaning, which, you know, encompasses a greater paradigm beyond our current judicial system. Um, however, one other thing that I have found very interesting in these, um, this trajectory is uh, policy language, right? So using language um, that, you know, relays like sentient beings, for example, or relays, uh, you know, intrinsic um, value or rights of, of ecosystems, which, or waterways or even soil, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so to support this paradigm within our human laws. Um, which again, I think everything comes back to. So I have a really exciting map to share with you guys. <laughs> so hopefully it'll work. Let's see. So is it working? Can you see it? We can. Sweet. So Earth Law um, created this map, which I actually, I should drop the this into the chat. Can I do that? How does this work? Please. Where's the chat? Or at the end, if you'd like. Okay. So, um, yeah, essentially, um, this map, as, as you click on different areas, it tells you where the rights of nature have been implemented. Um, and if there was, if it was an ordinance or if it was a declaration and, you know, um, a place where you can go um, and sort of take a look at the different pathways that have been created um, through different communities. And it, you know, it actually is, I don't know if it'll let me do that, but yeah. So that's fun. <laughs> I thought that was such a great one instead of going through all of them. I was like, I'll just, you guys can take a look. Um, okay, so let's go back. Um, and there actually, to be, um, to be truthful, there have been, because it's actually happening so quickly. Um, and, you know, we have um, two declarations in Canada, which are not in here. One of them just happened in March, I believe. Um, uh, uh, Magpie River in Quebec um, through uh, the Eno tribe and the municipality. So that's very exciting. And then um, Chilcotin also, I think, was last year. Um, River <clears throat> was also declared as a rights bearing entity. I always feel really funny because I'm like, how is that not even a thing already? But anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I wanted to share that with you guys because I thought that was a great resource. Okay, where am I? Right. I don't know how much time I have left, Laura. You have to tell me, and I'll just try to run through this. <gasps> I'm already at 21. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> you can continue for another 10 minutes, you know, if you okay. like or so. Yeah. Great. No okay, so <clears throat> this is the part that um, we really, because we are connectors, we're trying to connect a lot of these issues that we find are fundamentally quite related. And so the relationship between fundamental value, rights of nature and equity. So if we look at the fundamentals of rights of nature, they're really truly based on the recognition of intrinsic rights and value. So this is something <clears throat> that somehow has been missing in our operational perspective uh, and, and within our structures. Um, so the lack of fundamental and intrinsic value and therefore fundamental rights, um, you know, has, has really led us to a horrid collective history um, and geopolitical perspective and process. And I think that we sort of forget that um, literally whole nations are secondary citizens in the world, right? Um, and, you know, and all the people within them as well as, you know, so very, again, very exploitative perspective, right? Um, and extractive perspective. So value gauging, which I sort of talked about a little bit um, earlier is very problematic, you know, because it sort of gives a false power to everyone in thinking that we can gauge the value of things, right? 
um, of others, you know, uh, of nature, so on and so forth. And, and, but ecosystems function, like, so if you look at how we are part of an ecosystem, of the ecosystem, right? You know, whether, whether we like it or not, we're still breathing, eating, drinking. So that's just the reality. Um, but, um, so when you look at ecosystems function, they, they do as, a, as we all know, right? I think in this group anyways, that they function through symbiosis and collaboration. So um, it's really unfortunate and, I, and we're, you know, I'm not gonna get into it now, but we do talk about the sort of historical foundation as to where that separation happened, right? Um, and, you know, you know, one of the things, because people often say, they're like, yeah, but how can you not gauge value, right? And it's the, the point is, is not gauging intrinsic value, right? Because it's ungaugeable, essentially. But we can gauge, like, through, like, skill, right? And even then, there's a lot of room for error, and that's okay, right? And this is kind of what we say, right? Like, this is, we're all trying to move towards this, um, you know, together, and it's and it's awkward, and, you know, and difficult actually, because we're up against, you know, quite a big um, wall, I guess, in some ways. So another way of looking at it is just like value for gain or value through collaboration, right? Um, which also sort of change or allows us to sort of have a better um, opportunity to look at our, you know, economic system and how we actually gauge value. So, and so when we look at equity and equitable behavior or equity in practice, it's come from an understanding of fundamental value to everyone. And it's not just rights because rights are tools um, and to prevent harm, essentially. And they're based on, 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 you know, fundamental rights and value, right? So because our system is based on gauging um, a value, especially in law, right? Um, it's very difficult to do this without any biases, like I was saying. Um, and so, um, which again, you know, I, you know, are very hard, but they are normal because of our upbringing and everything that we see and how we relate to imagery of ownership or of freedom and, you know, how that's connected to ourselves and our demographics or personal global histories or positionalities and so on and so forth, right? But I digress. So, and we don't have very much time. So, um, so rights of nature and equity are based on the same issue, um, and but they're bringing to light this fundamental lens, which is what's really interesting about rights of nature, um, in a sense that it has that possibility. Um, and especially because it's very ecologically based, um, and in, again, in a way, bringing us full circle back to acknowledge a shared space and how we relate to it, right? and its sustainability. And, you know, we also sort of often say that laws are really good tool, but the shared perspective that drives them actually delivers the outcomes, right? So, I'm trying to see where I am here. Right, so collaborative design. So one of the things that we recognize um, in doing this work, right, is, um, you know, is supporting the whole system like so like so trying to support everyone in this right i think one of the examples that that we have and a, a recent one that we're trying to sort of support and deal with here is that farmers here on the island for example are told often late right that they cannot use the water in the river um to water their crops for example and they're sort of stuck having to deal with it on their own right and so um which is very problematic again right like there's so like there's like a separation between conservation and industry and business right which like that gap needs to be you know, to to come closer because i i feel personally that it is like all of our all of our responsibilities and they're all important at this point right so um this gap and to avoid polarization and and looking to more like like collaborative and funded solutions or there's you know the concepts of redistribution of resources for sure there's capacity building collective education place-based education and equal literacy which i think is a really big part of it um so 
you know, we've been looking at um, an ecosystem services fund that would be able to support um, both the shift um, in, um, you know, into sustainable practices because also industry, you know, even as a legal person is very changeable, right? Like there's a lot of room for being able to change both practices and, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, and the other thing, of course, is the educational campaign, which is really about collaboratively um, look, you know, re affirming, you know, intrinsic rights and, and values and so on and so forth. And I also, you know, I just want to say that I love the possibility um, of the lens of entering into contract with an ecosystem, right, which I think is so different than the way that we've been operating, because it encompasses quite a bit of what, you know, of all these things that I was saying um, from that perspective. And there's so much more room for collaboration with diverse perspectives um, in equal literacy, you know, oral sciences, you know, academic, culturally diverse, et cetera, et cetera. And that's it. <laughs> so I, sorry, I was thinking I, hope the, I wasn't talking too fast. But yes, thank you so much for having me. And I hope this was useful to you all. Um, I know that one of the main tools in shifting our engagement with this perspective often requires connecting with networks and supporting each other in these shifts, like regardless of our sectors. And oh, the other thing I want to say is that Open Team is also hosting a collabathon on the rights of nature, um, which will delve in deeper into the subject. I think we can look at it together from all different sectors, which I think is really exciting. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Neshma. Uh, I imagine that there are a, a number of questions. Uh, I have some too. Uh, but I'll just open up the floor for anyone who would like to kick us off. Steve. Hi. Um, <laughs> so, so I find this, this concept of entering into a contract with an ecosystem is, is very interesting and kind of in some ways the essence of, of what you talked about. In, in thinking about law, it feels like the conflict is between this concept of ownership, right? We have this this history of land tenure versus versus personhood. So, so in a in the corporate personhood that this is, that you started out by saying this is based on, a corporation is both owned and is a person, and and then the the personhood of the corporation is the embodiment of the owners, right? The shareholders elect a board, the board appoints a CEO, the CEO signs contracts on behalf of the corporation. That CEO can change, the board can change, the owners can change over time, but the sort of the person of the corporation stays the same. Mm -hmm. In this case, it, it feels like we need a different analogy because, because part of the problem is, so if there's an owner of the land, then, you know, it's the owner. And if there's not an owner of the land, if if the land is a person, then maybe the right model is more like a, a minor that needs a guardian and, and that concept of custodianship. And and if that's true, then then kind of this idea of, of a corporation, whereas as a director of a corporation, I have a fiduciary duty to act on behalf of the corporation and not in my own interest. So too, we want the custodians of of the land of the ecosystem to be acting in the interests of the ecosystem and not in their own interests and to legally hold them to that to that obligation because that's that's the the power that or the stick that keeps directors of corporations or CEOs of corporations who act badly <laughs> from right. from acting badly all the time. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> and, and then so one last observation would be that that maybe there's something about the rights of pets, which we've sort of seen, right? So pets are owned, and yet we have custodial obligations under the law more and more now, right? So if you abuse your pet, it can be taken away, you can be thrown in jail, so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it's a very good point that you're bringing up, and some of the... Um, some of the frameworks have been boards like so so in New Zealand it is a board um, that speaks uh, you know as the river it's majority Maori um, and it also has um, 
and Elizabeth, please, Ellie, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong in any of these things. <laughs> so um, yeah, so there's um, there is a board that speaks um, as you know as the the, the waterway, and it, and it it does have folks from municipality as well and government that are part of the board, and so that's one of the models. And then the other one is um, that I know of, anyways, is that any community member um, can actually um, speak as or for um, the ecosystem. So those are the two, the two different that I, that I know of. Um, yeah. Thank you, Steve. That's really great insights. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a, Kind of a high level question i guess i'll preface this with the fact that i'm definitely more on the science side of things and this is kind of a new mental model for me in terms of the legality and ownership um but i think on your last slide you were talking a little bit about you know education eco literacy along with the idea of you know ecosystem service funds and so when i hear both of those i am thinking about kind of the intersection and where those intersect especially as, you know, at least for traditional ecosystem services, you know, we're really focused on carbon and it's all about, you know, carbon. But I think in terms of your presentation and, you know, larger eco-literacy and traditional ecological knowledge, maybe your thoughts on, on these ecosystem service funds and how they can move beyond carbon and also how does that like educational eco-literacy aspect tie into that? Like, where do you see the intersection there, I guess, is my question. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so the way um, that we conceptualize the Ecosystem Services Fund is, is you know, uh, <clears throat> is essentially based on um, centuries of profit from ecosystems, right? Like, uh, from states, federally, and, you know, so on and so forth. And so in that sense, you know, the, the ecosystem services funds uh, would be coming almost like, ta like taxes, like ecosystems would essentially be taxing governments, right, um, who have been benefiting and so on and so forth, right? That's one way. Um, again, collaborative design, <laughs> very important, <laughs> you know. Um, and so those, so essentially those funds would go into supporting this collaborative and relational um, engagement with um, ecosystems. And that means both um, supporting industry in, um, in shifting, right, into sustainable practices, because it is better for industry, right, long term, so on and so forth, right. Um, and also, um, as a last resort, because if we actually do that, right, um, then we don't have to go to the last resort, which is litigation, um, um, you know, from like, especially like through, uh, like, you know, a lot of Indigenous people and community members don't have the funds to be able to deal with litigation, honestly, right? And, that, and actually what happens often is that um, corporations, so like I was saying, like for, you know, with, within binding laws or ordinances, where corporations and state will sue the people that are trying to sue, <laughs> right, um, for, um, for damages, right? And so, and that, again it's it's not sustainable so essentially this fund which is very different and and it's not a an um an or it's an end i think um with the current model of ecosystem services right because i think that they also serve you know a purpose of like uh, the carbon sequestration or carbon neutrality and so on right so this is almost very different and it's it's a more um it sort of closes the gap and it's 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 more about uh, like our engagement with ecosystems and our contracts with ecosystems and all that they've been providing and continue to provide essentially so that we can, you know, adjust sustainably, right? Um, in sort of our practices. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. That was super helpful. Thanks for the presentation as well. This was really informative. Yeah, <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I see. A question came through the chat. If Ellie, you'd like to 
add anything more about precedents and legal models, uh, feel free to do so. And then Anne, we'll go to you, I think, next. Yeah, hi everyone. Great to meet you. Um, sorry, I was a little bit late, but thanks for the wonderful presentation, Nejma. And um, yeah, I think that um, you know you covered like a, a really wonderful broad overview and gives us the lens of sort of like the bigger picture and how everything fits together, which is incredibly important. And then, you know, as to, we could do like a whole separate talk, I think on legal models and precedents, but just kind of giving, you know, a little, little bit of the lens, like from my experience and developing some of the laws in the US um, and then um, kind of tracking and, and Earth Lessoner is also involved with the development of, of laws around the world. Um, you know, that guardianship piece that we've been talking about is a key, um, you know, a key element of a lot of laws, like basically looking at how do you give a voice to ecosystems and what does that structure look like? You know, how do we create that in the law? Um, and uh, I guess kind of stepping back, like in the, in the, in the legal world, really in the U.S., like the, uh, um, we started with the idea of, you know, how do you, like the problem was there's a harm to an ecosystem and how do you address that in courts, like in litigation, like this is kind of the narrow litigation lens was like, okay, the standing problem, which is like who gets to go in court and sue on behalf of an ecosystem to protect it. And um, there was the essay kind of that's been um, you know, frequently talked about um, by Christopher Stone, do trees have standing, went into this whole analysis, which is very much like a Western legal framework view, which was not touching on the, all the lens from you know, indigenous knowledge and indigenous perspective and worldviews, but this very much like addressing this one issue of, you know, how do we get a voice in court? And that's kind of how, um, you know, so that's kind of one piece, just like historically the development was sort of like, we need a tool. And I run into that all the time with, you know, having a background in traditional environmental law, you look at, you know, the Endangered Species Act, there's so many limitations and inadequacies with those laws from the ability to enforce it to the remedies that are available. So when we have an issue, like what tools do we have to address it? And we realize that we don't have the tools, you know, in place. So like in the, in the litigation piece, but then, you know, before you even get there, like what we really ideally want is, is what you know, Nez has been talking about and what you all are doing is like, how do we create these systems and, and really reflect the way we are supposed to be living with nature anyway, so we don't actually have to be suing <laughs> all the time, you know, kind of litigation is like our last resort. It's kind of where we're at today because of all these systems and historically, you know, have been put in place, you know, to get us there. And so, you know, to Steve's questions, those are some great thoughts, like some of the work that we're actually just doing now, we're, we're really all at the, you know, we're all just creating a lot of these frameworks now, which is what makes it so exciting, but we're working on ecosystem-owned land trusts, so to really take the stewardship piece and to put in language, what does that mean, and put in governing documents, the structure, so that you are taking that ownership piece out and turning it into stewardship is like, you know, one example. And then looking at your policy language, I think um, to the question of animals is actually some interesting, an interesting article about animal animals owning, you know, like owning property or something. Like there's like been some like theories around this that are kind of all merging together to develop this, but I won't go on, you know, too long there, but there's, um, so yeah, the question of legal models and precedents, it really depends on like exactly, you know, what we're looking for, what we're looking to achieve and in what context, but we are doing a lot more work with land trusts and in this land stewardship realm. Um, and there's increasing interest there to really shift that framework, um, which is our which is our goal. So I don't know if I like answered the question, it's kind of like the big question, so I'm kind of giving an overview, but I'm happy to provide, you know, more information and share more about the projects that we're doing. Um, and I think, you know, just looking at your website, it's what, what you're doing, I think is wonderful work. And I actually came to Rights of Nature work through permaculture, I'm taking a permaculture class, which is kind of my way of better understanding um, ecosystems and how they relate together. So. Great. Right. <laughs> thanks, Ellie. That was really helpful. And thanks for just joining this call too. Um, Anne, we'll turn to you. Thanks, Laura. Hi, Nejma. Um, I'm curious what, and Ellie, maybe this is a question for you too. Um, so many of the landscapes, including agricultural landscapes that we 
humans are actually inhabiting are not uh, ecosystem. They're not the larger system. They're the city park or the uh, even national park, but they're they're definitely human um, controlled and not necessarily in a in a bad way. Not necessarily people polluting, but uh, you know we've talked about how do you try to get ecosystem function as a priority in a public landscape. Um, it has to be something that develops over a number of years. And so every time the municipal government changes, the DPW changes their tactics or their techniques. And this sort of long game that ecosystem health and restoration and recovery depends on is very hard to make happen. And I think that's also true in agriculture because of policies and subsidies and what's supported and what's not. There seems to be this kind of middle ground of a, of a landscape type in terms of how much it's being controlled and how much people are, how much it, it turns into a, a cultural landscape effectively. But if you want the goals to be uh, biodiversity, ecological health and function, which also trip into um, ecosystem services, you know, how can we start to think about those landscapes and presenting them and designing them in this context that says the landscape itself, it doesn't matter if you change who's in charge of the government or you change the, the person who owns this land, how do you have this kind of continuity of care through time, even as, you know, in, in a way like what Steve was talking about, the sort of corporate, corporation goes on, um, even though the people change. And if we want the landscape to be able to move forward, how might we be able to bring some of this into that structure and process? Um, <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll, I'll say sort of my thoughts on that. Nelly, if you want to add on to it, that'd be great. But I feel like that's why the equal literacy and educational campaign type things are really important because if we, um, you know, as a society understand our symbiotic relationships and have all these, you know, a number of examples, in fact, right, of how people, like when we talk about biocultural diversity, for example, and how that is a huge component in the health of ecosystems, right? So uh, rather than, you know, pulling people sort of out of that, um, and, you know, we've been doing this for millennia, right? Like as, as, as humans is, is um, you know, being in relation with, with different landscapes, right? And supporting different landscapes um, in different ways, right? So I think for me, I think that that's, that's a really big part, right? So the eco-literacy um, and that type of engagement um, you know, within community and, and also like, you know, for all doing it through collaborative design, right? So that people are able to engage in it and not just sort of being sort of fed this information in the way that we, um, you know, sort of, you know, our <laughs> untraditional education, I don't even know anymore, <laughs> right? But, you know, um, and so I think that that's, that's a big part. And I, and in fact, you know, as soon as you said that, Anne, I was thinking, I was like, yeah, Wolf Next Center is totally doing that, right? Like in having these different types of um, programs and so on and so forth. And, and so it's like how to spread that. So it doesn't actually matter what government comes in or out, you know, and it's so much about infusing these, these concepts within our policies. And that that's, that's the... It's not really, I don't feel like it's a huge shift, you know, like I think that it is so much about language, right, um, in introducing this language within our policies and within our structures, um, which will sort of make certain policies just kind of fall off because they don't really make sense, you know, anymore. That's the idea. So that's that's sort of what I wanted to, to say about that, but. I think just. Yeah, I think that's great. And one, one quick thought to add is that, you know, what I hear Anne saying is maybe part of it is like depoliticizing this situation so that you're looking at the lens of, and that's part of why really trying to take ownership out of the equation helps to say, you know, if you're going back to the question of what is in the best interest of the ecosystem, which is the same as what's in the best interest of all of us as being part of the ecosystem, and you keep those as your core guidelines. And if we 
do build consensus that that is core guidelines, then I think you can build towards that continuity. So it's not subject to like political whims going, going back and forth. I mean, there's obviously difficult, you know, there's difficult questions that arise in all of this work when you're interfacing with like extractive industries that don't have the interest, um, you know, the best interests of the particular ecosystem in mind which is how a lot in the United States, you know, the, the movement has grown from like a local community grassroots level and, and tribal nations as well, right? Because that's where you see that, you know, people want to say no to a particular harm in their community um, and have the authority to do that. And then also, um, you know, assert the rights of the, of the ecosystem, like with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights is an example of, of one where, you know, it was a community in Toledo saying, we're, we're, we don't have drinking water, you know, and we've got to do something. And so technically it wasn't enforceable under the law because of preemption issues, which is a whole other thing, which I won't get into right now. But it's like, you know, starting the movement and the conversation of like how we, you know, what, how do we get to and how do we redesign our systems so we can have the, um, we can have the framework um, that we want. So taking the ownership piece and ownership, you know, as it's like, you know, property ownership is like the classic, like law school is like the bundle of sticks example. So it's not, you know, you can have different layers. Like, so it's like, we already have regulations, right? That govern, you know, whether they are effective or not is another question. But like, if you turn those into like stewardship ethics and instead of like restrictive regulation concept, you have it as like a different way of, you know, relating it. And the economic piece too, that Nejma is speaking to is, is obviously huge. So it's like kind of a, you know, bringing all these all these pieces together so that's like my trying to be a short answer but <laughs> well and I, I think what we learned with the last administration is the more inertia we can put in the system the harder it is for the whims of politics to to overturn things so if 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 we've created a land trust and that has documents and and rules that have to be changed by some process it's like having that process be relatively hard to change me gives you continuity through inertia right and, and mm -hmm. so it feels like and and sort of we see the same thing with the, our federal bureaucracy right that we have these bureaucratic lifers but people career bureaucrats which are overseen by politicians that come and go but but it adds inertia to the system that makes it less likely that terrible things will happen mm -hmm. I'm also really optimistic that um, the ag industry can really help with this movement because, you know, we're starting to see more and more with regenerative agricultural practices that it is um, benefiting not only the environment, but also the farmers, all right, they're using less pesticides, they're, they're their crops are healthier, um, and they are making profit. So I think that it is really hard to take out, um, like the ownership piece from a farm from a farmer who's trying to make some money. But if we can use education um, to, to really demonstrate that these practices and like ensuring the health and being a good steward and ensuring the health of the environment is actually in their best interest, they could be really good supporters of this movement, right? And help, help it progress in that long term. Yeah, exactly. I see there's a question from Doran and I'm wondering if, if you can expand on that. <laughs> well, I, I think we're getting close to close out here, unfortunately, but I really would love to, you know, just perhaps just prompt, you know, an expansion on the vision of what's possible here. Uh, and I've been really thinking about like, how does this fit into some of the existing structures with an open team and some of our market placed incentives, whether it's, you know, the environmental service marketplaces and how we can actually perhaps think about things like watersheds rather than just, as you say, framing, like what is, you know, if we sort of, I think the gist of it is if we, instead of thinking of sort of combating corporate personhood, if we instead say, what's the biggest vision of when cor corporations become uh, positive citizens, where they're really representing the, uh, or sort of the, the, not only the rights of nature, but they're actually having rights of nature representation as part of the board and part of their charter. Um, and then, in fact, where we have, if we have endowments of these uh, rights of nature corporations of whole watersheds, then it's actually the farmer contracting with that endowment to be paid for improving the outcomes. 
and so we can I, I think there's an opportunity and i would love to just but at some point it was it was meant if we had more time to prompt a vision of what that might look like <laughs> uh a little bit further in terms of what if we can unlock that toolbox um but i i know we're getting close but uh, i'll maybe i'll pause for a moment and then maybe laura you can close us out for the next uh uh, uh, do this or the outro. I just, I just want to say that actually Ellie just wrote something in the, in the, and that's awesome. And I didn't know that, but that there's a company that wants to include Ocean as a shareholder. So that's pretty exciting. That's a really, I did. That's great advancement. Yeah, I was gonna say I welcome more conversation on that, Jordan. Like yeah. your, what you're thinking is right along the lines of what we're just delving into. Um, I think a really important aspect of this. So. And we saw Regen Network with their community staking DAOs exactly say 30% of their shares go to, you know, part of it is environmental sort of commons, but also some of the technical commons to help support that. So I think there's like, I think we're right on the cusp of having some visions, but I'm excited to, you know, again, work with all of you to say, okay, let's, what does that look like when we actually put the full apparatus behind it? Sort of the legal, technical uh, and environmental pieces coming together. Awesome. Well, we're at the top of the hour. So I just really want to thank you, Nejma, for this presentation. And thank you, thanks everyone for the good questions and dialogue. And I'm excited about the next steps and to continue this dialogue as well. Um, in two weeks, we'll have Sensorica uh, join us. And they're committed to the design and deployment of intelligent open sensors and sense making systems. So we hope you join for that. And uh, thanks again. Have a great day. Thank thanks you, everyone. <laughs>